or not? Next week, I'm going to ask okay. uh, people to, to sign up, and it's oh, okay. not there's nothing binding uh, since we don't charge people for stuff. It's uh, but we'd like to get some sense of it. Um, we actually did that this past term, and we ended up with about 25 percent more people than we thought. As you've seen, we've been kind of maxing out the, the space available here, which is a wonderful problem to have. Don't, don't misunderstand me. So Ross, you're not printing out the no. preparation anymore. It's all online. Correct. Okay. Um, Today we are talking, we're continuing actually our discussion of the writings, which is the third section of the Hebrew Bible. You will remember the three sections of the Hebrew Bible are the Pentateuch, or the Torah, as it's called in Hebrew, the first five books of the law. Then there are the prophets, and which is called the Nevaim in Hebrew, and then the third section, which is called the Ketuvim in Hebrew, are the writings. Last week we dealt with um, most of the writings, but I had to break it up because there's really too much content there. Um, books like Esther and Ecclesiastes and others, there's so much content and so much to deal with that I decided that this week I would do a second section on the writings, that is the, the, the writings section, the Ketuvim from the Hebrew Bible, and especially would concentrate on the exilic and post-exilic writings. Now, what does that mean? One of the most important events historically, and, and from a religion point of view as well, for the Hebrew people uh, was the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, and in fact, the destruction of the whole city of Jerusalem, in 586 BC by the Babylonians. Now, why was this so important? Because starting with Abraham, which was uh, almost 1,500 years before that, the promise had always been that God would bless the descendants of Abraham, and one of the signs of his blessing would be that he would give them the land of Canaan. He would give them a homeland. That's the promised land. That's why it's called the promised land, because it had been promised to the Israelites. To, um, to an extent beyond which we could probably even conceive, the very identity of the Jewish people was tied up in the fact that they lived in, in this part of the world because God had get, given it to them. Their whole sense of identity as a uh, religion, as a nation, as a people was tied up in the fact that they had this promised land as a gift from God. That God had anointed them and proven his blessing by giving them this homeland. Well, in 586, that got taken away from them. In 586, with the destruction of the Jerusalem Temple, and actually we'll talk about the dates, that Babylon actually conquered the southern kingdom of Judah um, more than 10 years before that, but they didn't, they turned them into a, a tribute. They turned them into a, a, a nation that paid tribute to and was obedient to Babylon, but because they couldn't really get them to toe the line, in 586 the Babylonian army came back destroyed the city, destroyed the temple, took the people off into exile. This is the Babylonian exile of the Jewish people. So here, the Jews were confronted with the question, how do we identify ourselves as the people of God when the very thing that had made us the people of God, the promise that you've given us of this land, has been taken away from us? And so the Babylonian exile was a period in which the Jews had to figure out how do we worship when we no longer have a temple, which is the place where God told us to worship Him? How do we um, continue to express our devotion to God? How do we stick together as a people? How do we keep our identity when we no longer have any of the things that that was tied to? So during that period of time, a couple of the things that happened was, during the Babylonian exile, after 586 BC, the Jews developed the synagogue system, which meant they could no longer go to the temple in Jerusalem to worship, and they said, well, for whatever reason, God, God had to have said it was okay for us to go into exile, so we need to figure out a new way to worship him. And they developed this idea that they would have these local, um, local churches, if you will, called synagogues. You heard the term synagogue, a Jewish synagogue, which is a place where they did not do animal sacrifice. They didn't do all of the temple things. They didn't have all the furnishings in the temple. They didn't have priests. What they had were lay leaders who arranged for these synagogues to be a place where they would read the, the scripture, the, the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible, where they would have prayer together, where they would have teaching, but they, they didn't do all the temple stuff because it wasn't they couldn't do that away from the temple. No animal sacrifice, none of that kind of thing. But the whole synagogue system as a way for them to continue to worship and to practice their religion happened because of the Babylonian exile. Then later on, when they were allowed to return to Israel, they kept that going. 
so that people who didn't live in or right near Jerusalem, people who lived, for instance, in Capernaum, in, up near Galilee, this was in the sermon this last week, Jesus is in, in the first chapter of Mark, goes into the synagogue in Capernaum to teach. The Apostle Paul would stop at synagogues. Well, synagogues only existed because that system was developed during the Babylonian exile. The other thing the Jews did during this time was in order to make sure they didn't forget what they were about or what their faith was, it was a time of a great collecting of what previously had been their oral traditions and law. Um, the Talmud, which we talked about last week, the Talmud was a, or is, a collection of writing, it's over 6,200 pages, if it's printed out in ordinary form, and what happened is during the Babylonian exile, they said, you know what, we're in danger of losing all this oral tradition, all this oral um, ideas and thoughts on everything, religion, on philosophy, on lore, on all kinds of stuff, if we don't start writing it down. Well, the thing that motivated that, motivated really the collecting of all this past wisdom, almost all of the Talmud is writings of rabbis down through the centuries. And they said, we've got to capture all this. So they started writing all this down. Much of that written religious tradition and history and philosophy and theology that was captured in the Talmud was done so because of the pressure that was put on the Babylonian exile. And today, that's a significant part of what it means to be Jewish, is to have the tradition of the Talmudic, the rabbinic literature. Okay. So all of this was really a result of the Babylonian exile. There are three books in the, um, the Ketuvim, the writings section of the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, that have to do either with the destruction of Jerusalem or with the time after the destruction of Jerusalem. They're not the only books. For instance, 2 Kings records a lot of the events having to do with the destruction of the temple, because 2 Kings goes up through that time period. We also have the prophet Ezekiel, who was the prophet that was at the same time, he was uh, simultaneous with Jeremiah, who was the great prophet of, uh, who wrote Lamentations, we're going to talk about. So we have other writings that touch on this. Uh, Lamentations and 2 Kings, for instance, there are a number of places where they directly parallel in terms of talking about the same events. But we're not uh, doing 2 Kings because 2 Kings is included under the prophetic literature. We're talking about here just the, the three books that are part of the Ketuvim, the writings of literature in the Hebrew Bible that have to do with the exile and post-exile. Is that clear? Okay, let's, let's get going talking about that then. First, the three books that we're going to look at uh, in the Ketuvim, they really fall, uh, Lamentations, the, the heading here isn't completely accurate. Lamentations is one of the five scrolls, right? we talked about that, the, the uh, megalot, the five megalot, the five scrolls which are used to celebrate particular seasons or festivals of the year. Uh, but it is the, the heaviest one, the saddest one. The book of Lamentations, um, well I'll get into the details of Lamentations in a minute. We're also going to look at Daniel, we'll spend more time probably on Daniel than anything else. Daniel is both one of the most important and also one of the most complex books in the whole Bible. You all were supposed to read Daniel this week. Did you do that? Yes. What did you think? Confusing. I have no idea what the... Well, it's, Daniel is like half history and half the book of Revelation. All right? And that's one of the reasons why I say it's complex. People don't know really how to identify it. It really is an apocalyptic book, I meaning a book of, of divine revelation. That's what apocalypse really means. It doesn't mean everything blows up. It really means a revelation. Revelation and apocalypse are synonymous with each other. Um, but it's a, an apocalyptic book, but some people call it a prophet, uh, a book of prophecy because it is prophetic in some ways. Some people call it a book of history because it does record some of the history of what happened during the Babylonian, uh, the Babylonian, and then later the Persian uh, control of that part of the world. So it's it's kind of a confusing book, but at the same time, it's one of the most important ones. The twelve chapters of Daniel are so full of content that were relevant not only to the Jews but to Christians today as well. And then we're going to look at Ezra and Nehemiah. You'll notice I have that as one book, although it's two books in our Bible, and in the 15th century, the Jews started thinking of it as two books as well. Um, it historically, traditionally, is one book, Ezra and Nehemiah, and it has to do with the return. So Lamentations is a book about the actual destruction of Jerusalem, the city of the temple. Daniel is a uh, book about the time after that, during the exile, 
And then Ezra and Nehemiah is about the return from the exile. And there's actually three different acts of return that, that occurred in Ezra and Nehemiah. So this gives you kind of a sense. The, the section in red is what we're talking about. This sort of lays it out as a timeline and relates it to other things. You will notice here that in the timeline, this is B.C., from 610 to 530 B.C., you've got the kings of Judah. Now, it says Judah because the, the divided kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel, had been destroyed by Assyria in 722 B.C. The southern kingdom of the divided kingdoms, the kingdom of Judah, continued to last until 586. And in fact, you say, well, why is this a bigger trauma that Judah was destroyed in 586 than when Israel, the northern kingdom, was destroyed in 722? Because when the northern kingdom was destroyed in 722 by the Assyrians, 10 of the tribes of Israel were taken off into captivity, never to be heard from again. Those are the 10 lost tribes of Israel, because the Assyrians were absolutely ruthless and trying to make sure that they they just disintegrated whoever it was they conquered. They forced them, they spread them out. They forced them to intermarry with other peoples, literally forced them to intermarry. They brought other people into the land that they had taken, and the few people that were left behind to keep the crops going and things, they were forced to intermarry. That's where the Samaritans come from. In the New Testament time, when we talk about the Samaritans, the Samaritans, the Jews, didn't like them because they considered them half-breeds. They were half Jewish and half something else that the Assyrians had brought in. Um, they practiced a different kind of religion. Uh, they, they had 11 commandments, for instance. You, you, you remember that, that they had taken the 10 commandments and changed it and added an 11th commandment that said that God ordered them to put a place of worship on Mount Gerizim, which was right outside the city of Samaria. So that they, that was an excuse for not having to try to get to Jerusalem anymore because they were cut off from it when the kingdom split up. Okay? So, the reason why, however, that was not as big a trauma is because the destruction of the northern kingdom, and the northern kingdom, they were horrible from day one from the division of the kingdoms. They never had a king that's considered good. They worshipped other gods, because the, partly because they didn't have access to the Jerusalem temple. The kings, from, from day one, started uh, coming up with other gods for them to worship. And so the northern kingdom was much worse. And when the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed, um, it didn't affect the temple or the city of David, which was Jerusalem. The sense that they had in the south was, well, it's too bad that our cousins all just got wiped out. But... God's promise is still valid because we still exist here, and we have the temple, which is the you know which is the the house of God on earth. We have the city of Jerusalem, the city of David, which is the holy city. Um, all of what's really important about God's blessing to us is still intact, and so we're okay. So there was not the same sense as when the northern kingdom was destroyed in 722, as when the southern kingdom was destroyed in 586, and the feeling was that everything that God has promised has now gone away. So the kings of Judah existed up until the, you see the, the Jerusalem and temple destroyed there. Um, it also lists some of the other prophets, Joel, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Obadiah, and Ezekiel. Daniel, you'll see uh, the long red line. Daniel is believed to have lived until he was almost 100. Uh, he lived through the Babylonian captivity. He was a very young man when he was taken into captivity in Babylon. We'll talk about that. And then he was there when the Babylonians were taken over by Persia, and apparently then lived in Susa. He was, he was then a counselor, a kind of a governor of, of Babylon, and then later in Susa. Um, so that he was under the Persian control as well. And it's believed he lived to almost 100, almost 80, well, just over 80 years in captivity, either under Babylon or under Persia. And then, you, so you get Jeremiah and Lamentations there, which leads up to and just slightly beyond the destruction of the temple in 586. Then you have Daniel, who was taken off into captivity, and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then, when you get the return from exile, when the Persians conquered the Babylonians, they let the Jews go back home. And that's the Ezra and Nehemiah time. So the three red bars there give you kind of a context along a timeline within the 7th, 6th century BC. Is that clear? Joanne? Um, on the ten lost tribes, there were remnants. They weren't lost. No, they were lost. Mm -hmm. yeah, they truly are now. Throughout, throughout history, various people, various cults especially, have claimed, oh, we are the lost tribe of Israel. But there's there's no nothing residual. The Samaritans say, well, we yeah, we're, we're true Jews. I mean, we have Jewish heritage. In fact, they would say, we have it more right than the, the Jews of Judah had. 
but in terms of any historic presence, there is no more. They, they did not return. They did not come back. There is no presence for them. Okay? And again, I've known, I can think of three or four cults who claimed that they were the lost tribes of Israel. There was one that was actually in Israel. It was sort of a, uh, a black Muslim Jewish kind of weird cult. And I met a guy who'd gotten out of it. Um, and they claimed that they were a manifestation of the lost tribes of Israel. Except they were all black African Americans from the United States. <laughs> black African Americans, that's what they're um, And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even making fun, that's a fact. Okay. Um, all right. Any questions about that in terms of what time we're talking about and why this is important? Okay, let's talk about Lamentations. Um, I can't quite figure out how to lay out my notes here. The Book of Lamentations is the Song of Sorrow. It is, the whole book is the prophet Jeremiah has five poems or five sermons, some people call them, and it's each of the five chapters in which he is expressing his grief, that's why it's Lamentations, it's a lament, which is a song of grief, over the destruction of Jerusalem. Now understand that Jeremiah had been a prophet uh, trying to get the southern kingdom of Judah to clean up their act and to return to a faithful relationship with God for a long time before this. And so he's present when God finally says enough and the judgment of God comes upon the southern kingdom of Judah through the hands of the Babylonians. So the book of Lamentation, poetic book, again, part of the Ketuvim, all three of these today are. Um, of course, there are liberal scholars who claim that it wasn't the prophet Jeremiah, but it's, it's very rare for people to say that. We believe it truly was Jeremiah. Since it's one of the five scrolls or the five megalot, it is one of the books that is read at a um, special festival each year. The festival where they read the book of Lamentations in the Jewish faith is the Tisha B'Av, which is the ninth of Av, the month of Av. And it is a, it's considered the saddest day on the Hebrew calendar, on the Jewish calendar, because it's the day that commemorates the destruction of both the first temple, which is what Jeremiah was present for, and the second temple. Now remember, I've talked about this before, Israel, the people of Israel, had two temples. The first one, which was built by Solomon, which is called the first temple, lasted from Solomon's reign, which was in the, the 10th century, up just make sure you don't get in front of it. That's okay, you can sit there, but just... Uh, um, from the, the time of Solomon up until this event in 586, when it's destroyed by the Babylonians. That's the first temple. That was the temple of Solomon. Then once the people return, what Ezra was there for, the reason Ezra returned to Jerusalem, was to rebuild the temple. Well, Zerubbabel was the governor, Ezra was the priest that got sent along, and they rebuilt the temple, in the, the early 500s, that is, you know, the early 6th century, in other words. And then they continued with that temple until AD 70, when the Romans destroyed the second temple. So there have been two temples. And when you read any of this kind of history, they'll talk about the first temple period, which means from around 950 up until about five, up until 586. And the second temple period, which is around 500 or so, up until BC, up until 70 AD. So you'll read about the two temple periods, first temple, second temple periods. That's because of those two temples. When they read the book of Lamentations on the ninth of Av, the month of Av in the Jewish calendar, they are commemorating the saddest of all times for the Jews, that is the destruction of both of those temples. And sometimes the book of Lamentations, or at least part of it, is also written, uh, read in the Christian so, uh, recognition of the tenebrae, that is, the good, on Good Friday. Usually it's Good Friday night, and in some churches they might even do it on Thursday night or Saturday night. The tenebrae is a service of darkness. It's a recognition of the sacrifice of Christ, the suffering and sacrifice of Jesus. Well, sometimes as part of that, for an Old Testament reading in Christian churches, especially in the Coptic, the Orthodox churches, they will read parts of the Book of Lamentations, which also are, is a song of grief, consistent with the whole idea of the recognition of the suffering and death of Jesus, okay? So, uh, where else do I want to go with this? About the five chapters, let's go ahead and jump into that. The five chapters or five sermons. The first of them has to do, and you'll notice up here at the top, we got chapter one or sermon one, and then down at the bottom in the black, we have what, it, what the topic is. 
Sermon 1 has to do with the prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, the, the, the inevitability, like the, the, the final uh, die has been cast, the Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. The second chapter has to do with the anger of God. The third chapter is a prayer for mercy, where Jeremiah the prophet prays to God for mercy for the people, the Israelites, and also for the city and for the temple. The fourth chapter is actually a, a uh, tale of the siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And then the final chapter, chapter 5, is a prayer for restoration. Now, this is a fascinating book, besides having the five different sort of poems or sections, because you'll notice uh, the second section down in the blue says uh, chapter 1 and 2, each verse begins with an acrostic. <coughs> chapter 3, each verse begins with an acrostic. Chapter 4, same thing, but not chapter 5. An acrostic is uh, a, a poetic literary uh, tool that's used to provide structure. I mentioned before that Psalm 119, each section of Psalm 119 is represented by a character in the Jewish in the uh, Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, Bet, Bet, Dalet, Gimel, you know, and, and if you look in your Bibles, they have the word spelled out for what that letter is, and they also have the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew character there. A lot of the Old Testament, they would use that kind of structure. Well, in the book of Lamentations, the first four sermons, or the first four chapters, are acrostic, like some of the Psalms. Each verse, that every individual verse, begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet in order. The first verse begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph. The second verse of each of those chapters begins with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Bet and then Dalet, and Gimel, etc., etc. So it is a very strict, very disciplined, poetic form that these are written in. <clears throat> the first, second, and fourth chapters each have 22 verses, which is exactly the number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet, so that each verse begins with a different character through the first chapter. The second chapter starts with doing the alphabet all over again. So each, each of those 22 verses starts with a different in-sequence letter of the, Jew, of the Hebrew alphabet. The third chapter has 66 verses, which is three times the 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So it goes through in threes, all the way through the alphabet, same structure. The fifth chapter is not in an acrostic form. Each verse does not start with the next letter of the Hebrew <coughs> alphabet, but there are 22 verses. So it does in that regard represent or, or is similar to the number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Um, and for some reason, in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th chapters, the order of the 16th and 17th letters of the Hebrew alphabet are reversed. And I, don't, I haven't found anybody who knows why that is, but it's a fact. You see that, can you imagine the discipline that's involved in writing a tale like this, a story like this, with that kind of discipline structure? Um, why? It is, why did they do that? Well, because the Hebrews, there are really two reasons. One, because as a poetic people, they... They found beauty in poetry. I mean, they, they found a more, a more sense of accomplishment in expressing things in poetic forms. You know, Hebrew is a very poetic language. The Jewish people have always been a very poetic people. Um, it's also, so that's one reason. It's just simply that as a, as a means of expression, it was, it was more, more difficult, more disciplined, and better. I mean, why do, why do people make poetry, poems in English or any other language that rhyme? Okay, same thing. Uh, there's a sense in which that gives it a beauty of order. But it's also true that for the Hebrews, more so than most anybody else that we could think of, um, the, the, there was real significance, even mystical significance, frequently given both to numbers and to letters. I told you before that <clears throat> every letter of the Hebrew alphabet has a numerical equivalent. The first nine letters are numbered one through nine. The next nine are numbered 10, 20, 30, 40, you know, the, the tens. And then the next four are 100, 200, 300, 400. So every, um, every letter in the Hebrew alphabet has a numerical value, which means every word has a numerical value. Every sentence has a numerical value. They've, they've designed, and some of these are very mystical, the Kabbalah version of this, the numerology associated with that, is very intense and very weird, to be quite honest about it. It's a technical word, weird. Uh, but the, even in a lighter vein, the, the, it's called a gematria, the idea of there being, there being value to letters and numbers. They would do this because they almost felt like that kind of sequencing of things was a better way to express important meaning. And so it really is evaluating, it's a, it's a higher value 
to, to do it that way because they thought that sort of gave it even a more mystical importance. Okay? Uh, and I'm not going to get into a lot of more detail about the gematria. I don't know a lot more about it than that in terms of the numerical value of the numerology. But a number of years ago, there was even a book that came out called The Bible Code. Did you all see that or do you remember it? Uh, yeah. In which somebody using the principles of the gematria went through and looked at the whole Bible, not just the Hebrew Bible, but the New Testament as well. And he claimed to have found all sorts of hidden messages that God had, you know, had revealed to him because of the numerical values based upon the gematria and everything else. Um, you know what? If God really wanted us to know that stuff, he would not have made it that hard to find it. Yeah, that's our fundamental belief is that he gave us the scripture in order for us to be able to understand him. Um, he didn't do it so that we would spend the rest of our you know, human existence in a treasure hunt trying to figure out what he really meant. Okay. So, in Judaism, as I mentioned, um, Lamentation is read on the fasting day of Tish, uh, Tisha Abav and um, also in Tenebrae services. But this gives you an idea of how complex some of the writing in the Old Testament is, the, the, the meter and the, the value that they put on things. Um, give you a couple of verses here that sort of, uh, I think, help us understand the significance of these. The, from the second chapter, and again, this is a chapter that talks about the anger of God. This is of the second sermon or the second poem. Lamentations 2, 5, and 6. The Lord is like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all her palaces and destroyed her strongholds. He has multiplied mourning and lamentation for the daughter of Judah. He has laid waste his dwelling place like a garden. He has destroyed his place of meeting. The Lord has made Zion forget her appointed feasts and her Sabbath. In his fierce anger, he has spurned both king and priest. You get the tone of that. That this destruction is a reflection of the anger of God, which is the theme of the second chapter, the second, second sermon. Okay? And then you get the third, which is a prayer for mercy in the third chapter. Lamentations 3, 22 to 24 says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You guys have heard that. All right? Um, the Lord's uh, compassion is new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. I've seen that on devotional cards and stuff. Most of you didn't realize that that was a statement made in light of the fact that, that the, the nation of Judah... The temple, the city of Jerusalem, has just been destroyed, or is just being destroyed. I shall say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. Grace. Who's the daughter of Judah? Uh, daughter of Judah simply means those, the descendants. Okay, the daughter of Judah, the nation of Judah. You'll notice he uses Israel here in terms of the whole of the people of Israel. Ten of those tribes had already been destroyed. The remnant that was left were the two tribes in the south. The daughter of Judah is a way of saying the descendants of uh, the tribe of Judah that was the largest and the most significant. I mean, it was the one through whom King David had come. It's the one the Messiah was supposed to have been born to. So the daughter of Judah, sometimes they talk about the Lion of Judah, you know, being the Messiah. The one that was supposed to come would be the heir to David. Um, this is the title that Haile Selassie, the emperor of, of Ethiopia took, and the Rastafarians believe he was the Messiah. You know, it gets very complicated. <laughs> but when you get into all these other kind of religious interpretations of those things, but it simply means those who are the descendants of uh, Judah, uh, the people of God. Okay? Um, so, you get the sense here that even as Jeremiah is writing this, there is this split personality between the utter destruction and what seems like the, re the rejection of his people by God, the fact that God has forsaken them and that everything is gone. But on the other hand, the fact that they trust that God will never fully forsake, that he will always still love, that he will fulfill his promise eventually. And both of these things are expressed. Both of those sentiments are expressed. So within the, the lessons from Lamentation, first... Uh, Jeremiah in Lamentations identifies that God is sovereign over the affairs of men. That this thing, this destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by the Babylonians, could not have happened except for God allowing it. In fact, we have, in, uh, particularly in the Kings, the, the First Kings and Second Kings, it talks about the fact that, Second Kings mostly, that God uses the Assyrians to destroy the northern kingdom. And he, it is God's, God using the tool that is the Babylonians to chastise the southern kingdom. So nothing is outside the hand of God, even this unbelievable event that seems to be 
a, a pagan army coming in and destroying us. God is in that too. Uh, second is that sin brings forth tragic consequences. Um, eventually, God will not be mocked. There's a limit to how much he will take. Now, God always still fulfills his promise, and he shows that to the, to the Israelites later. They do return. He does fulfill his promise. But in the meantime, because of their disobedience and their following after other gods, there are consequences. And then, there is always hope in the darkness. God will always fulfill his promise. He never has forsaken his people once he has made his promise to them. Okay? So those are the messages of lamentations. Um, if you ever feel like you're having a bad day, read Lamentations. You'll think it's much better than you thought because it is a dark, dark book, I tell you. Um, all right, let's talk now about the book of Daniel. Daniel, the statesman prophet, uh, apocalyptic writer, uh, all sorts of things. And again, Jeremiah Lamentations, Daniel, over 80 years worth of life, as best we tell, uh, can tell in terms of coming out of Israel as one of the captives early on, and then after that being the one who continues in Babylon and then later in Assyria. Now let me, let me give you a little background, too, about what's happened here. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, who's in charge of Babylon, um, you'll remember from any of the readings of this or us talking about it that various kingdoms ascended or took ascendancy at various times throughout this history. You have um, Assyria had been in power, the, the most significant power in this region immediately prior to this. That's why they're the ones that destroyed the northern kingdom of, of Judah 150 years earlier. Okay. Um, or of Israel, I'm sorry. The, prior to that, the Hittites, which were up in Asia Minor, what we know as Turkey, was a major area. You'll read about the Hittites. Egypt has been back and forth in terms of being a major world power all this time. So various powers, and then Persia, a little further east from um, Assyria and Babylon, came from the areas that we know of as primarily Iraq. Assyria a little further north, uh, Babylon a little further south. East of that, in what's now Iran, uh, was where the Assyrians came from. Or I'm sorry, the uh, Persians came from. Persians and Medes. In fact, Persian is still the language, is, is one of the old words that they use for the language they speak in Iran still today. So that whole Mesopotamia region, again, here, where the rivers split, remember Mesopotamia means the land between the rivers. And so this was not only where civilization, human civilization started, it's where some of the great empires grew up, including Assyria, Babylon, and Persia. Okay? So Babylon has ascended under the king Nebuchadnezzar, and he decides that now that they've gained more power, Assyria has been on the decline. They still exist as a people, but Babylon conquers uh, their first their capital uh, city, and they move to a new place, and then they, they conquer that, and the government moves to a new place. The place that they eventually moved was a town uh, further north in the Mesopotamian Valley called Carchemish. Well, the other major power at this time was Egypt, and so the pharaoh Necho sided with the few Assyrians that were left and decided to sort of uh, fight it out with Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians <coughs> at the city of Carchemish, where the rest of the Assyrian government still existed, although very small. So the, the very much reduced Assyrians were, gonna, uh, were being joined by the Egyptians in order to fight a great battle to try to defeat Babylon. Okay? On the way, Pharaoh Necho, on the way up to Carchemish, you'll see where he passed through. Okay, he passed right through Canaan, right through Israel, right near, he took the coast road, what's called the King's Road. Well, King Josiah, the really good king of Judah, went out to fight the Egyptians as they marched through, and Josiah is killed by the armies of King Necho, which was one of the things that really led to their decline. Because when Josiah was killed in battle, his son Manasseh took over, and Manasseh was horrible in terms of uh, setting up uh, worship of other gods than the one true God. And that's one of the reasons why the judgment against the kingdom of Judah actually accelerated, because Manasseh was so horrible. If Josiah had lived, you know, it's all in God's hands, but if Josiah had lived and they had continued to be true, to, you know, loyal to God, who knows what might have happened. But 
but Josiah was killed by the Egyptian army of Pharaoh Necho as they were marching north to do battle with the Babylonians. Okay? Then, Nebuchadnezzar is completely victorious at the Battle of Carchemish. The Egyptians are completely defeated. The Assyrians are pretty much destroyed, you know, never to be heard from again. And so, um, in, to, to take advantage of his victory, um, Nebuchadnezzar decides to march south, the same route that Pharaoh Necho had taken coming north. He's going to march south in order to solidify his victory over Egypt and to, to confirm the fact that Babylon is now the power in the eastern Mediterranean. Okay? Well, once he does that, as he's coming south, guess what? He's marching right by the city of Jerusalem, which is the capital city for this, uh, the semi-independent. You know, they had been, they'd been an independent kingdom. They'd sort of been played off back and forth with, with other kings, but um, they, they weren't really under anybody's control. Well, because he went down that far, Nebuchadnezzar went that far with his army in order to chase the few uh, Egyptians back home and to make sure that his victory was complete, he got into Canaan and decided, okay, I'm going to go ahead and, you know, take over this nation of this kingdom of Judah. And he does. And from there, he then heads directly back from Jerusalem, back over to Babylon, his hometown. All right? So that was what happened. That's how it is that the Babylonians ended up coming and controlling both the city of Jerusalem. Now, I said controlling because, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the first thing they did was simply conquer it. They didn't destroy it. As you'll see on the map up here, in 605 B.C. is the first deportation by Nebuchadnezzar when Daniel is taken to Babylon. That's when this happened. He marches down to Jerusalem. He conquers them. In other words, they basically give up. And he takes some of the, the Israelites from Jerusalem captive to take them back to Babylon with him. Actually, he doesn't do it to make them slaves. He takes the very best of the, of the Israelites, young it says beautiful, they had to be without blemish, intelligent. He wanted to take them back because actually the Jews were widely respected by almost everybody for, their, for being well educated, for being well cultured. Uh, the Jews insisted that you know, all their children learn how to read, which was really rare. And so the idea that these young Israelites can come back and serve us and actually make us better, that's why Nebuchadnezzar said after he got Jerusalem to surrender this first time, he took some of them back with him, and that's where Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went back, okay? That's in 605. Then, in 597, if you just look down from that, the second deportation is when the prophet Ezekiel goes along, and Ezekiel writes these things about by the rivers of Babylon, you know, uh, about weeping there in exile in Babylon. But the city and temple was still intact. It hadn't been destroyed. And then the third event in 586, so we're looking here at almost 20 years later, after, the, after he really conquered it, they ended up going back and completely destroying the city and destroying the temple. Because it turned out that the, the Jews, the Israelites, were not very good at having somebody else be their boss. And he continued to have trouble with them, and finally in 586, he marched back over there and destroyed everything. And that was the time where they were taken off pretty much in total into exile. Now some were left behind to take care of crops and things. The Babylonians were not nearly as bad as the Assyrians in terms of how they treated people. The Assyrians, you can go in, if you do any research on this, they have all of these bas-reliefs of these things that the Assyrians would do to their captive prisoners. You know, like impale them on poles and cut off their hands and feet. And, I mean, all this kind of, they would do that. The Assyrians, much of their power came from the fact that they terrorized. You know, the vast majority of times the Assyrians were such a horrific army and so terrible to cities that they conquered, if the cities resisted at all, that most cities just gave up to the Assyrians. They didn't even try to fight back, because they knew that if they fought back, at the time when Assyria was really powerful, if they lost, it's going to be horrible. Babylonians, well, they were tough. They were pretty rough, burning the city, and they were not nearly as bad as that. They left some of the Jews behind to take care of the crops and sort of manage things. The ones, a lot of the ones they took off, they let them stay together. There actually were two locations that they let the Jews set up communities. They didn't force them to intermarry. They didn't torment them the way the Assyrians did their captives. They even took a lot of the best of the young people and made them very important. And that's the story of Daniel. Okay? So very different kind of feel from the Babylonian captivity. But still, they had been conquered. The land was no longer theirs. The temple had been destroyed. The city of Jerusalem was no more. And so still they had this grief and this trauma 
But they had the ability to collect themselves and figure out how they continued to move forward as the people of God. Whereas the northern tribes of Israel, they got taken by the Assyrians, never got that chance. You know, they were completely destroyed. Okay, very different kind of situation. Um, questions about any of that? What? What? Here first, and then you will. Uh, were the Babylonians? Uh, I mean, it sounds like they were another type of educated people, or they would not have done that. I mean. They knew what would help them more. They were going to use them to their benefit. Were yeah. they were they a mixture of people that were similar to the Greeks and Romans? Or? Um, yeah, you're just following. They um, the all of these people at their height were very cultured. Even the Assyrians were very cultured. If you have, if you've ever been to the British Museum in London, these giant carvings they have of like these winged lions and all that stuff, those are Assyrian. You know, so their arts had, had achieved a very high level of sophistication. Uh, the Babylonians too. In fact, I think I have a picture here. Hang on a second. Uh, um, here we go. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world were the hanging gardens of Babylon. This, uh, this apparently, by all descriptions, an unbelievable structure that had terraces in which they grew um, whole crops and fruit trees and grapes and and it was all that the king of Babylon had built it for his wife who was not from Babylon she was from somewhere else she was from an area where they had more plants and trees and greenery than they have in the desert well it's not a desert actually but you know, there are areas around Babylon that are not all that attractive even though it's Mesopotamia they have rich areas they have dry areas too you guys have seen the pictures from Iraq we're talking about Iraq here this is this is the what's the current nation of Iraq and so the king of Babylon had the resources to build this building, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, in order to make his wife feel more comfortable because she had fruit trees and grapevines and plants and, you know, all, and all of this stuff was on a building, okay? Uh, so they were very sophisticated, very capable. Now, there's no question about that. Uh, but then the Assyrians, you know, they, they had their high point as well. They were a little more cruel, I think, but they also were... We're quite cultured at their, in their heyday. All right? Grace? Oh, and then Bill, sorry. Are you using Assyrians and Syrians? No, no, no. Assyrian is not the same as Syrian. A S S Y R, Assyrians, was a people that came out of the northern area of what we know of as Iraq. It is not the same as Syrians, which come from the land of Syria, which is further south and west from there. Okay? Not the same thing. There was never a Syrian Empire. There was an Assyrian Empire. Okay? Is that clear? Yeah. I mean, we could call them something else, but uh, that's what they were, their name was. Okay, let me go back. All right, this is where we were. Um, Bill had a question. Yes, Bill. You Sorry. mentioned Ezekiel being taken off. Yes. What happened to Jeremiah? Um, Jeremiah, we don't know any, any details about his death. Uh, the last we know of, uh, he was taken into exile, but we don't know any more than that. We don't have any writings of Jeremiah after the exile. Now, some scholars say that, that the writing that he actually did about the, the, the Lamentations, I mean, he wrote the, the letter that is the letter of the prophet Jeremiah, and then after that is Lamentations, some scholars say he wrote the book of Lamentations while he was in exile in Babylon. Some say, in fact, if you go to Jerusalem today, on the right outside the Damascus Gate, on the western side of the city, there's a cave, a little cave there. That's called the Grotto of Jeremiah. And the guides will all tell you that's where Jeremiah lived, and that's where he wrote it, and then, well, we don't know that. You know? Like our old uh, pastor, Earl Palmer, said, when you hear a story like that, you don't want to completely discount those traditions because many of them are probably true. But you hear something like that and you, you have to say, well, one wonders. <laughs> one wonders whether that really was where Jeremiah stayed and where he wrote and all that kind of thing. But um, that's the, the tradition. But he did get taken into exile, but we don't have any record of what happened with him in exile. Unlike Ezekiel, who wrote about it after that. Okay, we're here first and then John. Joan, did you raise your hand? Or? No, I okay. was mentioning. John, uh, did I read correctly that that Jeremiah uh, um, he was offered kind of like uh, uh, what do you call it uh, amnesty 
and was, was offered by a captain of the Babylonians to take him to the capital and to live with him and he would pay his salary and take care of him and Jeremiah would eat at his table. I think that's in Jeremiah. Ah. But Jeremiah chose not to do that. He chose to, to remain with the exiles there. In, in, I don't remember that. It could very well be, but I don't remember. It, it was really, it was, it, it really impressed me because this captain offered to give Jeremiah, because he spoke, he, he tried to get people to surrender to the Babylonians right. and save their lives. And, and so this captain offered him this Okay. And and he he stays in he stays in Jerusalem, and then they all say we're going back to Egypt, and he says don't do that, and they they try to kill him, you know, they try to pretty bad, but yeah. he did stay there. Well, I, I have I'll have to look at that. I didn't I don't remember that, but I have I didn't reread Jeremiah for this class. I apologize for to. to well, I just read it recently. That. That's so, why. That's why. Um, that. Right. But the Jeremiah, of course, the weeping prophet. He he was troubled on all sides. God told him he was not allowed to marry. <laughs> Um, he had huge opposition. He was imprisoned. He was beaten. Um, he was rejected by everybody. He didn't have anybody on his side. Uh, so yeah, Jeremiah, I wouldn't be surprised about what he got offered a bride and then turned it down because he was used to having the rough side of things. So, okay. Um, in terms of, in the book of Daniel, this is the introduction where we get introduced to Daniel and his four friends, whose names are, which you probably don't know, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You know them, of course, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or, as my wife, is Carolyn out there yet? As my wife said when she was growing up, they said it's, um, make a bed, shake a bed, and to bed we go. That's what they <laughs> so. All right, so this is what Daniel 1, this is how it starts. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Now this is, in other words, the, the Josiah has been killed by the Egyptian army as they march north to fight the Babylonians. Um, after he dies, Manasseh comes on the scene, and Manasseh rules for, for a relatively short time, two years, I think. And then Jehoiakim comes on, again, not a good, a good king. And then Nebuchadnezzar decides to, you know, to conquer Jerusalem as he's going by to make sure that the Egyptian army is in complete flight and they're completely defeated. So in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. So the golden vessels um, that are from the temple in Jerusalem are now in the temple of a pagan god in Babylon. That actually comes up later when uh, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, uh, Belteshazzar, is king. All right, we'll get to that. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and of nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The language of the Babylonians was Chaldean, which later was called Aramaic. Recognize that? The Babylonian exile is also why the common language in Jesus' day was not Hebrew. Most of them spoke that. But it was Chaldean because they had learned to speak Aramaic or Chaldean when they were in exile. And they kept speaking it after they came back to the Holy Land. Um, the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To the Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Um, to, well, and I'll keep going here, the next part of it. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. King Cyrus was the Persian king that conquered Babylon. 
Now, in between these two passages that I just read, there's an interesting little passage where the, the, uh, the young Israelites were supposed to eat the food from the king's table, very rich food, meats and wine and all sorts of things, in order to, because the, to the Jews, eating food that had, been, that had been sacrificed to idols or in some other way was impure, for instance, wasn't kosher, they weren't supposed to do it. And so Daniel asked permission to not have to eat that food, to eat their own food, and the person responsible for him says, well, no, you can't do that because if you don't eat the good food and you get looking sickly, then they're going to get me for it. I'm responsible for you. Daniel says, give us 10 days, let us eat vegetables and drink water instead of all this rich food and see how we're doing. And after 10 days, the guy who's responsible for him had to admit that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego looked better than all those guys that were eating all those heavy foods and drinking all that wine. And so he said, okay, you can keep doing that. And that happens right before this passage. Okay. Um, I want to take a break and then we're going to come back and talk about some of um, the visions of Daniel and some of the meaning behind it. Any questions before the break? Okay, let's take 10 minutes. I'll give you a big break here. Uh, about nine minutes after, we'll come back together. Thousands of years, they went through various cycles of up and down. So Babylon had two major periods of ascendancy. And in this period, the Second Babylonian Empire, uh, you can see here, you might recognize that this really is the, this is Mesopotamia here. This is much, in fact, pretty much all of what we identified as the Fertile Crescent, the area where civilizations first arose and where a lot of the powerhouses, in fact, if you were to draw on here the major empires, of course, you've got Egypt here, the Hittite empires here, Babylon, Assyria would have been just north of it here, and then Persia came from this area. So all of these uh, general eastern Mediterranean part of the world, or the ancient Near East as it's called, uh, Babylon was controlling most of what was really useful territory in terms of fertile in that time period. And as I showed you earlier, they were quite cultured in terms of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was built by one of the Babylonian kings in order to make his foreign wife feel more at home because she came from an area that was more green, had more trees, so he built the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which had vineyards and fruit trees and all kinds of other things in and on this building so that she could stay indoors and just walk out on these patios and experience what it was like to be back in her homeland, which was much greener. Yes? Is that, is that still the remnants of that? No, uh, not in existence. In fact, almost, there's only one of the seven wonders of the ancient world still in existence, and that's the Great Pyramid of Giza. All of the rest of them, the Colossal, Colossus at Rhodes, the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus, uh, all of the others have been destroyed over time, most of them because those places got conquered and they were all big and it ended up being a huge supply of building materials for something else they wanted to do, okay, and so this was all destroyed. But uh, it was renowned, I mean the whole world knew about the glory of these, these hanging gardens, so uh, it really was a historical thing and an example of the kind of power that Babylon had at its peak. Now I want to talk for a minute about um, about the visions of Daniel, the part of this that freaked you all out when you read it this past week. Daniel, the first part of it reads like history. It's about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being taken off and becoming leaders. And it has to do with the, the first parts of the book, and I'm going to give you a structure of Daniel in a minute. The first parts of the book have to do with, yes, Daniel interpreting um, dreams for Nebuchadnezzar, but, uh, and then something that happened to Belshazzar, his grandson. But the, uh, the main part that people get hung up on are the visions part. Daniel has a vision starting in, well actually he has, in, in chapter 2, he interprets a vision for uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and it is a great statue. In fact, as you just read it, it's a wonderful story. Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> Carolyn and I used to joke, she would, we'd open the newspaper and there'd be an ad in there and it says, oh, there's a psychic fair this weekend. But then you knew that. Right? <laughs> the idea that if you're really psychic, you shouldn't have to be told these things. Well, Nebuchadnezzar feels that way, and he has this dream that troubles him, and he calls all of his wise men and sorcerers and magicians and says, 
I had this terrible dream, and I really need to know what it means. And they said, sure, just tell us what it is. And he goes, no, you're supposed to be magicians and wise men. You tell me what I dreamed, and then tell me what it means. And they went, well, oh, I can't do that. He said, well, I'll tell you what, if you can't do that, then I'm going to kill you and your families, and I'm going to turn your houses into rubble. So, how much time is it going to take you to figure this out? <laughs> and he says, not only you, but all the other wise men in Babylon, I'm going to have them killed and their families and tear down their houses and turn them to rubble. Well, the word goes out, and Daniel, is count, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are counted among the wise men. So, the person who's responsible for, Shadrach, or for Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego tells Daniel, says, well, sorry to tell you this, but unless these guys come up with something, unless a wise man is able to tell the king his dream and interpret it by tomorrow, I'm going to have to kill you guys. Uh, so Daniel prays to God and uh, has a vision of interpretation, and he comes back to the king and tells him, okay, great king, here's your dream. You dreamed of a great statue. The statue had a head of fine gold, a breast, of arms, uh, breast and arms of silver, a belly and thighs of uh, bronze, and legs of iron and clay with ten toes. And he says, O king, this, this is the meaning of your dream. The various parts of this statue are various kings and kingdoms. And he doesn't go into the detail, but scholars generally have agreed, based upon what happens historically, and I'm going to show you this in a minute, that the head of fine gold was Babylon. That was Nebuchadnezzar and the kingdom that was in power right then. The breast and arms of silver was the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. We sometimes call it the Persian Empire, but the, the, the Medes, the people of the Medes and of the Persians had joined, and so it really is uh, the Mede and, and Persian Empire. In fact, they talk about the law of the Medes. The first, uh, the first king, Cyrus the Great, uh, his grandson is called Darius the Mede because these two peoples had sort of joined. The next kingdom, which is uh, seen as being represented by the bellies and thigh of bronze, is the Greek Empire, especially, in this case, Greek, uh, the Greece, Greek Empire passed its golden age when, it, when it, it was flourishing as Greece. You come to the time of Alexander the Great, which is what's believed to be the bellies and thigh of bronze, and then the legs of iron and clay is thought to be either Antiochus, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is one of the, he was one of the, uh, descendants, uh, or what do you call it, one of the people who took over from the generals of Alexander after Alexander's death, and or perhaps it means Rome. Um, and each of these is a vision in Daniel 10, and then Daniel, uh, or Daniel 2, and then Daniel 7 gets very kind of weird visions. You know, it's, it's, at, it's Daniel 7 and on is where you get the really strange stuff that people get kind of freaked out about. Uh, but it's believed that almost all of the visions that he had in Daniel 7 are simply sort of uh, echoes or replaying equivalents of the vision that he has in interpreting, or the, the interpretation of the vision he has for Nebuchadnezzar in the second chapter. Okay? Well, let's look at that. In Daniel um, 11, uh, I'm jumping ahead a little bit to where he gets into some details because I want to I show you how this has been interpreted by biblical scholars and historians. Daniel says in Daniel 11, Now then I tell you the truth, three more kings will appear in Persia. He's prophesied about Persia already, ascending. And then a fourth who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will appear who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. After he has appeared, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. What the heck is he talking about? <laughs> well, if we look at the history immediately following the Babylonian Empire, this stuff starts lining up. For instance, um, you had Babylon, but just to the east of them was the empire of the Medes and the Persians. What happened is the Medes and the Persians first conquered the area that had been the Hittites, then they sort of backtracked and they conquered Babylon. Now Babylon was conquered by the uh, Persians, the Medes and the Persians, only 47 years after they had destroyed the city of Jerusalem. So it's still in the 500s, it's five, wait a second, I've got the number, in 539, Babylon is destroyed by the Persians. So just 47 years after they had destroyed the temple in the city of Jerusalem, they themselves fall. Then the Medes and the Persians go, you know, uh, further to the east. They conquer part of India. 
Um, and then down south, they conquer Egypt, so Persia is controlling the whole known world at that point. The Persians, interestingly enough, from uh, the prophecy that, that Daniel gave, it says three more kings will appear in Persia, and then a fourth will be far richer than the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Well, the, king, the Persian king that conquered Babylon was King Cyrus the Great. Four generation, the fourth generation, uh, that is three generations after him, was King Xerxes, who was the wealthiest of all, who's the one that solidified the Persian Empire, and the one that attacked Greece. Completely consistent with the prophecy of Daniel. Right? So, so far, Daniel was right. These, the Persian take over everything, they conquer them, the fourth generation of the Persian dynasty that's in power attacks Greece. Then, we get Alexander the Great from Greece. Again, reading to you from after the fourth in the generation of Persians stirs up against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will appear. He will rule with great power and do as he pleases. Alexander the Great conquered the whole known world. He left Macedonia, which was the northern province of what we call Greece today. It was broken up in different provinces then. His father, Philip of Macedon, who is one of the most underrated people in history. Philip was a, a brilliant ruler. He put the army together. He trained them. As soon as he died, uh, mysteriously, they think his wife might have killed him, and maybe Alexander had part of it, had a part in it. Um, Alexander took over the army and just proceeded with the campaign that his father Philip had already planned to take. He travels from Greece. He takes over the all of Asia Minor, which had been the Hittite Empire. He travels down through the Holy Land, conquers everything there into Egypt. He conquers all of Egypt, uh, which had been conquered by the Persians, but still was a power. Um, he is named a god in Egypt and founds the city of Alexandria, named after himself. He named over 20 cities Alexandria after himself. He's sort of like George Foreman's sons. He, every place he went, he would found a city and call it Alexandria. You all know about that, right? George Foreman had like five sons and named them all George Foreman. They're all named George. I think it's five sons, either four or five. Um, couldn't think of anything else, so I can't get better than that. So then, Alexander went back up through the Holy Land, cut across what had been Babylon, conquered Babylon and Persia, went on up and across all the way into the Indus, all the way to the Himalayas, conquered Afghanistan, all the way into India. He planned on going all the way, and he was never defeated in battle. Never defeated in battle. They still study Alexander's military tactics in, in the military academies today. And this was in the 250s, okay, the 200s. Uh, the, uh, when he got as far as the Himalayas, his army said, that's enough, we want to go home, Al, come on. <laughs> And, and so he finally, just because they almost refused to go any further, he turned around to come back home. He got as far as, you know, like halfway and died of mysterious circumstances at age 32. He was 32 when he died. You know, like somebody said about, somebody said about Beethoven, simply, if I, I could say that by the time Alexander the Great was my age, he'd been dead for 25 years, you know. Um, so... 32 years old, the greatest, perhaps the greatest conqueror in history, with the exception of Genghis Khan, who actually conquered more than Alexander did, but the whole known world. Then, Alexander, being 32, didn't have any heirs. And when he died, there was this huge fight between his generals, a civil, well, several wars, actually, between his generals to decide who was now going to control the Alexandrian Empire. And it's because of Alexander speaking Greek and Greek culture doing all of this conquering, that's why Greek became the dominant culture everywhere, including in the Holy Land. That's why everybody spoke Greek, even if they spoke some other language which was their original language. Everybody spoke Greek. Everybody um, was part of Greek culture. The Greeks invented architecture, they invented science, they invented medicine, uh, they invented history. Almost anything you want to point to in terms of a discipline that we recognize in Western culture, the Greeks invented it. Well, at first, when Alexander conquered all these people, he, he made them speak Greek and made them put up Greek schools and that sort of stuff. And so at first it was by force, but then very quickly they said, you know, this is pretty good stuff. This, this is good. And so they liked it. So much so that that's why, because he conquered the Holy Land, Canaan, the Palestine, 
um, that they started speaking Greek and they were so much into Greek they forgot how to speak Hebrew, which is why a hundred years later they ended up translating the Hebrew Bible into Greek, the Greek Septuagint, because the people couldn't even speak Hebrew anymore, they only spoke Greek. So this was Alexander the Great. Well, and Alexander, um, a couple of images of him, this is him dying in, in, uh, in actually it was in Babylon, I think he died. Babylon or Baghdad, which was it? One of those B cities. Um, I am just drew a blank here. I think it was in Babylon that he actually died on the way home. Um, this is him on his deathbed. They don't know exactly why he died, whether it was a disease or poison or whatever. Uh, but he was the great conqueror. The interesting thing was, in Daniel's prophecy, he says, after he, that is the great ruler that control, con conquers everything and does as he pleases, after he has appeared, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. Well, after all of the, the, the generals and the relatives, because there were some relatives back in Macedon, fought civil wars against each other to decide who's going to be in charge because Alexander died without an heir, um, when, it all, when, the, when the smoke cleared, there were four of them left, four generals. Two of them were fairly insignificant. You can see over here, oh, you can hardly read that. It's off the edge. Cassander and uh, Lysimachus controlled Greece and then part of the area, it's the kingdom of Pergamum, it's called, which was part of uh, Western Asia Minor. The two main ones were Seleucus and Ptolemy. Seleucus controlled the area that was called the kingdom of Syria. Ptolemy controlled Egypt. And they were the two most powerful ones that were left. The other two were sort of just like off on the edges. The four winds, that the, you know, the kingdom was split into the four winds. There were four generals that ended up controlling it. Um, it will not go to his descendants, Daniel said, nor will it have the power he exercised because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. Well, what happened is, um, Seleucus, one of the, the descendants of the Seleucid, or Seleucus, from General Seleucus, but the Seleucid Empire in Syria, was Antiochus IV, who called himself Epiphanes, which means... Um, a revelation from God. He thought pretty well of himself. He decided that um, he wanted to have more power, Antiochus IV, so he attacked the Ptolemaic Egyptians. Well, at that point, there was a new bully on the block, and its name was Rome. And so the Egyptians asked for help from Rome. Rome came in and pushed Antiochus IV, who was the controller of the Seleucid Empire, back and as he was pushed back from Egypt by the Romans, who were helping the Egyptians, he got as far as Israel and stopped, and he decided to kick the cat. All right? What, it meant, what I mean by that is, since he wasn't successful in conquering the other great power, which was the Ptolemaic Egyptians, he stopped in Israel and said, I'm going to make it as bad on these people as I possibly can. And so, you have the uh, reign of Antiochus. I'm sorry, this is cut off over here. Um, the reign of Antiochus, which, which he tried to force the Jews in the Holy Land to become Greek by force. What he did was, he said they could not assemble for prayer, that they were forbidden to observe the Jewish Sabbath, that if they possessed any of the Hebrew scriptures, then um, that was illegal. Circumcision was made illegal, dietary laws were made illegal, and they were told they had to sacrifice to pagan gods. In fact, he set up an altar in the temple in Jerusalem. Now, this is all after they've come back from the, from the exile. This is 350, 400, 450 years later. So I'm, I'm past that. The only reason I'm telling you about this now is because this is all quite eerily in fulfillment of Daniel's prophecies. And in Daniel, he also talks about the abomination of desecration. And it's believed that that is a prophecy about when Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus, Antiochus the fourth Epiphany, set up pagan altars and were sacrificing to pagan gods in the temple in Jerusalem. Well, what happened is, as a result of that, um, I think I, no, let me back up. Um, I've got it. Oh, this is going the wrong way. This thing's hard to control. The Jews decided to fight back, and in 167, when the soldiers of Antiochus were going around trying to force the Jews to sacrifice to pagan gods, in one of the villages, the local priest, Judas Maccabeus, and his sons decided that's enough. They killed the soldier, they killed the pagan priest who was with him, they went up into the hills and started a revolt, 
the, the Maccabean revolt, revolt in the books uh, between the Testaments, between the Old Testament and New Testament, the Apocrypha, there are the books of 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees, and others that talk about the Maccabean rebellion, where they fought back against these Seleucid rulers, particularly Antiochus IV, and they won, and they ended up defeating them. Unfortunately, the way they ended up finally winning is they asked the Romans to help them, the way the Romans had helped the Egyptians. The Romans decided they would help them, but then after the Romans defeated the Seleucids, they decided to stick around, which is why the Romans are now in control when you get into the New Testament. 100 years or so later, when we get to the New Testament, the Romans are controlling. They're controlling because they invited them to come, to help them defeat the Seleucids, to help them drive off Antiochus IV and his people. And so they won that battle, and they ended up taking the temple back and cleansing the temple. And the story of the ha Hanukkah, you know, the Hanukkah lights, the eight days of Hanukkah, it's when they had the, and the menorah, you know about the menorah with the candles? Those are all representative of the time when the Hasmonean, when the, when the Maccabees took the temple back and cleansed it, and they did not have enough oil to light the sacred lamps in the temple. And so they prayed, and they lit the lamps. They should only have had enough oil for one day, but the lamps miraculously stayed lit for eight days. So that's the eight candles on the menorah. That's the eight days of Hanukkah. The Hanukkah lights for eight days. All of that is a celebration of the defeat of Antiochus IV, the cleansing of the temple, and the renewal of the ability of the Jews to worship freely. Okay, so that's all that history. The reason, again, I'm telling you that now, that's intertestamental, comes much later than Daniel, but Daniel prophesied things that you don't have to twist your tail very far to see the parallels between what Daniel said was going to happen and what really did happen, okay? Including the, um, the, the desecration of the temple by Antiochus and everything else, okay? So, keep going here. Some of the features of the book of Daniel that I want to emphasize for you here. Daniel is unusual in that it is written half in Aramaic, or about half, approximately half, which again, Aramaic was the common language in Jesus' time. Jesus probably spoke Aramaic. In fact, when he says Talitha Kume, to the little girl, to arise, the word Abba is not Hebrew actually, it's Aramaic. You know, the, the sort of um, friendly name for father, Papa. So a lot of the words that we see in, when we, in our English Bible, when we have words that are in an ancient language, that's Aramaic usually, not Hebrew. Because <coughs> Aramaic was the common everyday language. Well, the book, the, still, almost all of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, which was the traditional historic language of the Jews and was sort of the holy language of the Jews. But Daniel is written, the first seven chapters of Daniel are written in uh, Chaldean, Aramaic because he was in Babylon when he wrote it. That's the language of the Babylonians. As I said before, the book of Daniel is apocalyptic, meaning it's a, it's, a, it's a miraculous revelation from God of things that will happen in the future. That's the usual scholarly way to identify it, but some people list it as a prophetic book. Daniel is listed in the books of prophecy in the Christian version or order of the Bible. Some call it a historic book. It's a little of everything, all right? It, the book of Daniel reflects one of the most formal structures of any book in the Bible. And I'll show you that in just a second. It does predict in fairly specific ways the coming of major empires that came after Daniel. And it predicts the eventuality of God's kingdom being established overall. In fact, one of the things, if you don't remember anything else I tell you from Daniel, I want you to remember one thing. You better remember other things I told you from Daniel, but you better remember this thing. Uh, if... Have you ever heard anybody say, well, Jesus never really called himself the Son of God. He called himself the Son of Man. You ever heard, him, heard that? Ever heard anybody make that claim? That used to be a big thing with college professors. Oh, well, Jesus was a great teacher and a great guy, and we'd all be better if we did what he said. But he never claimed to be God. He didn't say he was the Son of God. He said he was the Son of Man. Well, let me tell you what the Son of Man means. Um, in Daniel 7, I'm using a different Bible here. Usually I have it marked. Uh, Okay, here you go. Seven, uh, chapter 7 of Daniel, starting with verse 9. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. That's one of my favorite names for God, the Ancient of Days. His clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool, his throne was flaming with fire, and his wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. 
Then I continue to watch. Uh, well, I'll jump down here to verse 13. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That's what son of man means. Okay? Um, Given all authority, glory, and sovereign power, all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That's why Jesus called himself the Son of Man. What is the text? Uh, Daniel 7. I started with verse 9, but the real kicker is starts with uh, verse 13. Nine that to the end? Yes. Um, that passage... And others in Daniel are predictive of God's eventual kingdom coming to pass. That all these other kingdoms that Daniel prophesies about, that eventually God will establish his ultimate kingdom, which will replace all of it. Okay. So it is apocalyptic in terms of an eternal sense as well. Now, in terms of structure, the book of Daniel, as I said, is one of the most structured of all books in the Bible. It's, it's built on what's called the double chiasm. It starts out with a historical prologue, and then it has kingdom prophecies having to do with the image of the, 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 of the king and of the kingdoms in the statue. Then the trials of God's people. Then kingdom, the king's prophecy in two forms. We have first the uh, Nebuchadnezzar's tree cut down. Then that story about Nebuchadnezzar, it was predicted that if he failed to recognize God, he would go mad, and he does, and is restored once he finally is able to see that God, there is one true God in heaven. Then we have the Belshazzar, who it says is, um, he talks about my father, Nebuchadnezzar, he actually was the grandson, there was a king in between. Belshazzar, uh, the writing on the wall, he, sent, he gets in a, has a drunken party with all of his friends and girlfriends and everybody, and sends to have the, the implements from the temple in Jerusalem brought out of uh, the temple there, and they're drinking out of them just as a lark to make fun of the God of Israel. And this hand appears out of nowhere and is writing on the wall, and they can't understand what it means. And it says, many, many tekel parson. So the queen mother, uh, Belshazzar's uh, mother, remembers that there is this guy Daniel, who's an Israelite, who was really good at interpreting for Nebuchadnezzar. So he, they call for him, he comes in. First he chastises them right there to their face for being, um, for blasphemy, for using the things of the God of Israel to just have a party with. And then he tells them what this means is, you have been weighed and found wanting, and the days of your reign are measured. That very night, according to scripture, was the night that the Persians conquered Babylon. And Belshazzar lost his kingdom. All right. um, then we have the trials of God's people, that is the worship, uh, Darius, the king Darius, who was the, uh, the third in the line. It's king Darius that was king when... Um, Daniel refuses to worship the idol, and he gets tricked by, or gets trapped, sort of, by the other officials who are jealous of him. He gets thrown in the lion's den, which was the punishment for not worshiping, for worshiping any god other than the god of the, of the king of Persia. That's with Darius, the Persian. And so, because of, that's the lion's den event. Then you have the kingdom prophecies about the wild beasts. Then it switches from Chaldean to Hebrew, and you have the same structure all over again. This very structured, designed story of the kingdom prophecies, the trials of God's people, king prophecy, a, a prophecy about the Messiah, another king's prophecy, the trials of God's people, the king's prophecy, and then there is a prophetic uh, epilogue. Very structured system. Half in Chaldean, approximately half, and half in Hebrew. You probably never noticed that, reading it in English. Um, no. But it is very specific in terms of how this book is structured. And again, once more, this is a survey about the Old Testament. You need to understand that much of the Old Testament has that kind of very intentional kind of creative design behind it. It's not just a bunch of words. Okay? In terms of how, how much focus was committed to creating these writings for us. There's a lot behind it that we don't notice just by reading it in English. Okay? Questions about any of that? 
Uh, okay, Carol first. Do, do you know why it changed to Hebrew at that point? I mean, uh, there's, no, there's no given reason for why he changed. It's, I think it's representative of the fact that he was in Babylon, and he's writing prophecies at first about basically God's work and active activity um, in giving him the ability to, to interpret uh, dreams and visions in Babylon, and then he comes back and he's giving larger visions, visions from God about what's happening in the world, and then those are recorded in Hebrew. He was a man of two languages at that point, and he uses half in one and half in the other. And it's sort of, I mean, it may be a good way, a good thing to say that it sort of reflects the fact that in Daniel as well as, as in Ezra and Nehemiah, um, major theological themes there have to do with God using other peoples. First, that God used the Babylonians to what appeared to be destroy his own people, at least their, their place in the land, and then God used other peoples, that is the Persians, to bring his people, the Israelites, back into power. But then all the way through, there's a strong message which Ezra really hammers home, and that is, yes, God uses other people, not the Hebrew, just the Hebrews, both to judge us and to punish us and also to lift us back up to a place of prominence, but we have to be separate from these people. That yes, God uses them, but we are separate from them. We're different from them. Ezra has a connection when he gets back after being gone for a while and discovers that, and, and Nehemiah a bit too, but Ezra finding out that they, the Jews, contrary to directions, had started intermarrying with non-Jewish, you know, marrying non-Jewish wives, and goes nuts because that was part of the problem is that they had not distinguished themselves as being discreet and separate. Okay, Bob? Is this a little bit artificial because <clears throat> there were no chapters or verses, right? Well, it's not. Art it's artificial in the sense we, we can assign chapters and things. The reason that they break it up, some of the things in chapters, for instance, the reason that Lamentations is in five chapters is because there are five sermons. And so when the guy was assigning chapter designations, he gave one chapter to each of the five sermons. So um, switch that around. I mean, it's not like the chapters were there and then they wrote these things into them, but when they assigned the chapters, frequently they broke them up according to where these separations were. You, it doesn't always hold true. For instance, you'll notice here, the kingdom prophecies at the end, a kingdom of the north and kingdom of the south, break um, right in the middle of the 12th chapter, and then the, the second half of the 12th chapter is the, the, the rest of the epilogue, or is the prophetic epilogue. So it doesn't break exactly there, but the chapters were, t the chapters were signed taking some of this into account. But yes, the chapter frequently the chapters break in really weird places. You know, I think it's hard to account for that sometimes. John, who was the uh, help me? Who was the first king of the Medes? Darius, Cyrus, Cyrus, and then it was Darius. Uh, it was Cyrus, and then you actually had I don't know, Zerp. Then Cambyses, who was only king for eight years. Well, where did Darius come in? Darius comes in next. Okay, so he was his grandson. Right. Uh, Cyrus was king for just a few, I mean, he was king for, for 20 years, but he was only king for a few years after he'd gone for Babylon. Who was the second guy? The second guy was Cambyses, C-A-M-B-Y-S-E-S, which we don't know a whole lot about other than that he's the one that conquered Egypt. And they stopped building the temple uh, during his time. Then Darius I and then Xerxes, all of whom play into the story. And then Artaxerxes, who's part of Ezekiel or Ezra. Let me keep going because I'll pick up some of that right now. Okay. Um, the dream of the image of the four kingdoms, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but there is a very clear structure, sort of, it's like a tide. It goes out and then it comes back in terms of the recognition or relationship of these things. Um, again, I'm not going to spend time with that. Let's go on to Ezra and Nehemiah. I'm going to run out of time here. Ezra and Nehemiah have to do with the return of the Jews to Israel. So, or to, to Canaan, to the land of Israel. After uh, Daniel's time, when the Persians have defeated the Babylonians, Cyrus the Great, Cyrus the First, who was the, the, the one who conquered Babylon, he gave permission for the Jews to return. In fact, Cyrus apparently was generous, it wasn't just with the Jews, he was generous to religions all over the Persian Empire. He allowed them, he even financed the building of temples to other gods. So he apparently was quite generous in that regard because he had a different way of thinking about it. Whereas the Assyrians were ruthless 
the Babylonians were still, you were still sort of in slavery to the Babylonians. Cyrus was trying to win everybody's affection. He was trying to be seen as a just and kind king so that people would want to be obedient to the Persian Empire. Um, we have really three parts to the book of Ezra. And I've, I've inserted here so that you get just a time frame. The book of Esther happens right in this time period. The book of Esther takes place in the Persian Empire, the capital of Susa. They are in the city of Susa when Esther happened. She is the queen of Artaxerxes. She's the queen of one of the kings that plays as part of this whole thing. Uh, the first return is under Zerubbabel, who is the assigned governor of the area we know as Israel. And he was sent back, the high priest Joshua, different Joshua, not the Joshua we've talked about before, it's much later. Uh, Joshua the high priest, they go back, in the first six chapters of Ezra, we have the account of them going back to Jerusalem with the intention of rebuilding the temple. And they do that, they're there for about a 20 year period, 538 to 516. Um, in that same time, a little bit after that actually, the book of Esther occurs, we believe. The, she was a wife of Artaxerxes, which was the fifth king of Persia. Then you get the second time of return under Ezra. This is recorded in Ezra chapter 7 to 10, where they, a group of people go back with Ezra, who was the high priest, in order to finish the rebuilding of the temple, because they'd started and then stopped. Then you end up with the third section in Nehemiah. Now, remember, I'm taking two books together, Ezra and, Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah. I'm looking at them the way the Jews look at them. And the third return was under Nehemiah, which had to do with the rebuilding of the city walls around the temple so that the temple was protected and the city was reestablished. So um, these are the, the, the key players in this whole story. Cyrus, who is the king of Persia that is recorded in the first chapter of Ezra, and 539 tells the Jews that they can return and rebuild the temple. I'm going to show you that verse. Then you have a king in between, which was the king uh, Cambyses, who was there when they stopped building because they no longer had the king's real enthusiastic support. Then the third king of Persia was Darius, which is talked about in Ezra 6. That's the time when the Jews were allowed to go a second return and to re finish rebuilding the temple. Then we had Xerxes, that we don't hear a whole lot about. He's the one that tried to conquer Greece and failed, so Daniel prophesied about him. But then you get Artaxerxes, who is the king of Esther, who's married to Esther. He's the one that goes back and looks and says, well, yeah, you guys ought to be doing this. He lets Ezra take another group back, and then he lets Nehemiah go back and rebuild the walls. Here's a couple of verses related to that. This is for the first part of Ezra, the first six verses. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. See, this was seen as the fulfillment of prophecy. You will remember, Jeremiah lamented the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, but he also said, God will not forget us. There was always that hope, as well as the, the lament for the destruction. To fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, said. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build the temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Now remember, Cyrus did this for other religions too, other conquered peoples too. Any one of his people among you, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. Notice who is in Jerusalem. People back then had a very clear sense that gods resided in certain areas, and when you got out of their area, they didn't have any power anymore. So the God who was in Jerusalem. And the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. So... Cyrus, one of his first acts is to tell the Jews they can go back and rebuild the temple. Now, this is Cyrus the Great. He gave permission to rebuild. Then there is his son, Cambyses II, and during, under Cambyses, construction halted. In fact, if you read the prophet Haggai, and we have, we're not talking about Haggai today because he's under the minor prophets, not under the writings section. The book of Haggai basically is an admonition to the people, why did you stop? 
you need to pick up the stuff again and start and finish building the temple because they had stopped by that point when Cambyses was the ruler of Persia. And then Haggai, Zechariah prophesy and urge construction to begin again. Then you, we go on further to Ezra 6, and by this time, Cambyses is out of the picture. He, was only, he only ruled for eight years. And a new Persian king, Darius. And we have this passage in Ezra 6. King Darius then issued an order, and they searched in the archives stored in the treasury at Babylon. A scroll was in the citadel of Ecbatana in the province of Medea, and this was written on it. Memorandum. They used to say memo back then, too. Memorandum. <laughs> In the first year of King Cyrus, the king issued a decree concerning the temple of God in Jerusalem. We just read that decree. Let the temple be rebuilt as a place to present sacrifices and let its foundation be laid. It is to be 90 feet high and 90 feet wide with three courses of large stones and one of timbers. If you go back into 2 Kings uh, and you read, or 1 Kings, and you read Solomon's description of how they're going to build the temple, that's what this is. This is the same description. The measurements, the courses of stones, the courses of timber, the course of timbers. The costs are to be paid by the royal treasury. Also, the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple in Jerusalem and brought to Babylon, are to be returned to their places in the temple in Jerusalem. They are to be deposited in the house of God. Now then, and I jump down here, do not interfere with the work on this temple of God. Let the governor of the Jews and the Jewish elders rebuild this house of God on its site. Moreover, I hereby decree that you are to do for these elders of the Jews in the um, I decree what you are to do for these elders of the Jews in the construction of this house of God. And it goes on into detail about what his governors in the land of Israel are supposed to do to support this and help them, not prevent them. Because in between the time during Cambyses when they had stopped building was partly because they were getting uh, getting complaints from the people, their neighbors, especially the Samaritans who lived north of Jerusalem, okay? So, here we have Cyrus the Great gave permission to rebuild. Under Cambyses II, construction was halted, and Zechariah and Haggai both say, get back to it, guys, why are you stopped? And then, under Darius the Great, the, the third generation of the rulers of Persia here, they're given permission to complete it. In fact, he tells his governors that they have to help. Then, uh, Ezra 7, we have... Um, the, the next return when Ezra the priest goes back in order to teach the law to the people and to help with this second sort of burst of energy to try to rebuild the temple. After these things, during the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, he was the son of Darius, um, or the great-grandson of Darius, excuse me. After these things, during the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, son of Zariah, the son of uh, Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Mariathoth, Mariath, Mariahoth, the son of Zerahiah, I didn't practice these, the son of Uzi, the son of Buki, the son of Abishua, the son of Phinehas, uh, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest, this Ezra, not the other one, <laughs> This Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a teacher, well versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. The king had granted him everything he asked, for the hand of the Lord God was on him. Some of the Israelites, including priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, and temple servants, also came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. This was the husband of Esther. The story of Esther. This is the same guy, Artaxerxes, whose Hebrew name was Ahuserius. So you remember, you got Cyrus, you got Darius, you got Artaxerxes. And after Artaxerxes lets Ezra go back, another return, which we just read, we then get to Nehemiah, which is all part of one book in the Hebrew Bible with Ezra. And we hear this from Nehemiah 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. In the month of Sislav in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, which was where Esther lived, that's the capital of Persia, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. 
I was cupbearer to the king. And it goes on. And I don't, I'm actually missing a page here. Okay. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine. Remember, he just said in the previous passage, I was the cupbearer for the king. That, that was a high-level position. A cupbearer was somebody who sat around and drank with you and gave you counsel. He also made sure nobody poisoned your wine, so he was somebody you really trusted. Okay. Um, I took the wine and gave it to the king. It had, I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let, me, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him. Now this could have been Queen Esther. We don't know for sure. With the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. Nehemiah returns to the city of Jerusalem, where they have finished building the temple, but the city is still in ruins. And Nehemiah, in a huge organizational effort, they talk about Nehemiah the builder, it was less Nehemiah builder than Nehemiah the organizer. Because you read these wonderful passages in Nehemiah where each section of the wall of the city is assigned to a group of men, you know, certain from a certain family group or lived in a certain area, various, various designations, and each of them starts working on their section, and they build them all at once, and in very, very short order, the whole wall around the city of Jerusalem is rebuilt so that they can defend it and protect it, and the temple is protected. That is the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Once they return, then you get into, you know, they reestablish temple worship, they still have a synagogue system out in the country. They now have the Talmudic writings, all of the, the, the things that happened to the people of Israel when they were in the exile in Babylon. Many of the Babylonian uh, Jews, the Jews that are in exile in Babylon, do not return. Many of them have even traveled elsewhere. It's not like all of them came back. That's one of the reasons why, as you get down through the history of the Jewish people, you have Jews everywhere. There's, there are Jews in Egypt. There are Jews in you know, uh, Asia Minor. There are Jews in Persia. There are Jews everywhere. Part of the reason is because uh, during the Babylonian exile, uh, there are several reasons. There are several different diasporas for the Jews, but the biggest one was the Babylonian exile. When the Babylonians were defeated by Persia and Cyrus the Great said, you can go back home, some of them said, well, you know, I don't really want to go back there because the city's destroyed and we had really bad experiences there, but I always wanted to see Turkey. You know, or Asia Minor. And so, some of them traveled other places then because they then had the freedom to. They were not no longer treated as slaves. Cyrus has, had given them the permission to either return home or many of them went somewhere else after that. So, this had a huge effect. And then you get all of the prophecies of Daniel fulfilled where you, uh, you know, after the Persians, then uh, Alexander the Great comes along, defeats them. Then you have the, the generals after Alexander taking over. You have the Seleucids and Antiochus IV and the reestablishment of the purity of the temple and the Hasmonean dynasty, which was Jewish, and then the Romans taking over. And then we have the New Testament. Any questions about that? <laughs> Got it. And then something spectacular happened. <laughs> Got it. Okay, good. Mary, did you have something? Uh, Early in uh, Ezra, it mentioned some of the people that went back. Yeah, there are long lists. There, there are in, um, in a couple places there. And you said, like, the, the Joshua mentioned isn't the one that we do think of. No. But it does say Mordecai. Would that be the same Mordecai? Well, Mordecai remained. Uh, I don't think he would have returned because the story we have, he was a fairly old man, and he's seen as being a major figure, like the governor in Susa. Um, he would have been probably second only to Artaxerxes himself, so it's unlikely. Mordecai was not an uncommon name, apparently. So, um, yeah, it would, have been, it would have been like saying, you know, 
Jim went back. Oh, which Jim? You know, or uh, this Ezra, as opposed to that other one. I, I've given you 14 generations so that you know which one I'm talking about. So there were names that were fairly common uh, back then. Uh, I, I'm not saying it absolutely couldn't be, but it's unlikely because at the end of the book of Esther, we find Mordecai being really responsible for the whole Persian Empire under Xerxes. You know, he's the senior official. Uh, which again gives you some idea how well thought of the Jews were, that they would have those kinds of positions. But I love the fact that it says in Nehemiah that the king with the queen sitting beside him, and this is the same king that was married to Esther, and that could have been Queen Esther sitting there going, wow. hey, let him go. This is a great idea. I like this. I like this guy. Let's let him go. You know, so. Any other questions? For such a moment as this. For just such a moment as this. Okay, well, you now know everything there is to know about Survey of the Old Testament. <laughs> or everything I can tell you in, in eight classes or seven classes. Next week, we will look at the transition a little bit more specifically. The transition from an Old Testament survey to the New Testament times. And we'll talk a little bit about the intertestamental. I've given you a little touch of it today in terms of the Hasmonean dynasty and the Maccabean rebellion and the revolt against Antiochus IV. We'll talk about that and how that kind of led us, leads us into a New Testament survey in preparation for January when we start New Testament survey, where we'll pick out historically exactly where we're leaving off. The things I'm going to talk about next week in terms of transition into the New Testament will not be on the test, so don't worry about that. The rest of the notes from today will be up on the website before I go to bed tonight, so you will have those for a week to look at as well. And let me reassure you again, for those of you taking the test, it is multiple choice. There will be nothing on the test that is not in the notes that I give you. If you, um, if you have any questions about that, you can feel free to give me a call or email me. But if you have a good, and, and again, you have to know it only well enough to recognize it on paper because it's multiple choice. You don't have to memorize all the stuff I gave you. You may look at the eight pages and go, holy moly, how can I remember all this? Learn it well enough to recognize it when you see it, is what I'm asking you to do. Boy, I'm being easy on you guys. Nice. And we are grateful. Nice. We are grateful. Why are we I don't know. They, just what I know about you people, I don't know why I'm so nice to you. We know you're going to get harder. Are, are, yeah. are you going to drink pass-fail or preserve? Yeah, and the, and the test is pass-fail. I haven't decided what pass-fail is. I mean, I don't know if I missed two questions because I don't have any questions I'm going to have on it yet. But it will be pass-fail. It will be multiple choice. I'm telling you everything that's going to be on it. <laughs> will you assist me when I take the <laughs> Yeah. Gary Grinke asked if it was going to be open book. <laughs> take home exam. Take home exam, yeah, right. My goal is for you to learn this, not to... Have, you know, the, the point is to learn it, not to be able to spew it back to me, or not to feel, not to worry about taking a test. And so I want to. This to me is the easiest way I can get you to actually learn it, is by telling you exactly what you need to know for the test and only testing you on that. Okay. One of my favorite teachers in, in school was a history teacher who, before every exam, would stand up and give you a 20-minute presentation with all the answers and everything on the test. I asked her later, why do you do that? I mean, who could not give pass an A? She says, those who didn't study or read. Yeah. And still not understand why I'm telling you. Yeah, don't see the relationships. Any last questions? We will see you next week to talk about the transition.